Hello, welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you can chat with us live on Facebook or hop on over to YouTube and catch us live there as well. So hello and good evening. Let's get right to it. We have a full house tonight. Jason Richards, how are you? I'm good. How are you, John? I'm great. Y'all started without me. Anyway, <laughs> I had to hop out, hop back in, and John was sitting here going, Hi, welcome to the Masonic Roundtable. We're all here, except Jason's not. Anyway, Jason Richards, <laughs> past master vacation lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C., glad to finally be here good good well you look good that's all that matters uh i didn't introduce myself john ruark past master of the patriot lodge number 1957 in fairfax virginia next up mike the intern hello and good evening good evening mike cambrick here hammy mike the intern from lakeshore lodge number 307 in madison ohio where i am the current uh, senior warden and lodge education officer I am also the senior steward of Castle Island Virtual Lodge out of the Grand Lodge of Manitoba. Excellent. Good evening. Good evening. Juan Sepulveda, how are you? I'm doing great. It's good to be here with my brothers, Juan Sepulveda from Orange Blossom Lodge, number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida, and the brother behind thegentlemansbrotherhood.com. Good evening, brothers. Your lighting is on point tonight. I have to give you some props Thank for you. that. Thank you. You look great. Thank His you eyebrows are on fleek. Yes. Pow. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to throw you a compliment, but you you missed your opportunity. Robert Johnson, how are you? I'm doing good, fellas. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, Robert Johnson, Whence Came You podcast, a former past master over at Waukegan 78 and a uh, sitting secretary at Space Novum 1183 in Libertyville, Illinois. Thanks. Hooray. So full full cast and crew tonight. Um, want to give a special shout out to the sixth member of TMR, which is you, who the patrons who've been supporting the show for the past year. Uh, if you really like Masonic, Masonic education and you want to see some behind the scenes stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable. Love to see you, chat with you, and uh, just do all sorts of fun little kooky surprises that we've had um, over the past year. So see you over there, and thanks. Tonight's episode is an interesting one. Um, Jason and, well, Mike, too, are, are resident historians on the, on the show. Um, wanted to pick something that uh, is a little obscure and something probably most Masons in their first couple of years aren't really exposed to or aware of, of this legend, this mythology um, that, that has a Masonic tie-in. And so uh, tonight we'll be talking about the four crowned martyrs and... Um, doing the yeoman's work, I'm going to hand it over to Jason to set the stage for the discussion tonight. Jason, take it away. All right. So um, this is this is actually uh, all Mike Cambrex's idea. Um, he sent it over to me and I was like, yes, let's let's totally do a show. Show on that this. big book you were just hauling around, Hammy. You had just, I, I turn and you got, you're pulling back. What is this? Mackey's Encyclopedia. Boy. So if you if you look in, in Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, um, you will find a very interesting uh, article on the four crowned martyrs or the Quator Coronati. And it is a a legend that uh, that dates back to um, about the it's the reign of Emperor Diocletian in in uh, Rome and it's it's between about it's really the the early fourth century late third century uh, common era and it tells it's it's set in the the era of the really the the persecution of um, Christians under uh, under Rome. And at, at this point in time, you, you have Christianity coming on the scene as a relatively new religion. Um, and, uh, you know, goes against the, the pagan religion, um, 
that that Rome ascribes to, you know, based on on the Greek religion. And uh, there was a, a lot of instances of of persecution and martyrdom on the part of the the Christians. Um, and so this uh, this is a legend that uh, has been found in several um, several church uh, writings, and it it tells of um, as soon as I so it's not inherently Masonic. Mind. That's the real question, right? It's... That, that's true. It is not inherently Masonic. Mm-hmm. So you, you're, um, right. while while you're you're looking that up, one thing that I know if you start if you start doing some Google searches, you'll find a lot of like Catholic resources. Um, for the tradition of the church as well. So, um, yes, it goes way far back, um, this this legend uh, uh, of the four kings or the four And I martyrs. think our, this particular episode of TMR is going to serve a large purpose, um, not only uh, for Freemasonry, because if you Google the four crowned martyrs, before this episode went live, it was like the sixth result. It is not something that is like blowing up all over the web. So uh, this is why this episode is in particular pretty exciting. So, you know, the legend of the four crowned martyrs actually tells the tale of four or five stonemasons. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because this is, according to the sources we looked at for the research for this episode, this is one of the very few instances where we see the Catholic Church actually venerating stonemasons. Um, you know, if you look back at the records of operative Freemasonry, uh, specifically in Scotland, where they're, they're most um, readily traceable, you know, you, you find that the, the Catholic Church and the Stonemasons Guild were, were very close in the sense that the Catholic Church at the turn of the, you know, 11th and 12th centuries, you know, owned a lot of land and had a lot of riches. And they used those riches to build cathedrals and, and monuments to Catholicism to the Christian faith. And who did they employ in the construction of the abbeys and the cathedrals, but the operative stonemasons guilds across across Europe and stretching, you know, stretching from Italy to Germany to England to Scotland as well. And but at the same time, you don't have a lot of records of the, you know, the Catholic Church's dealings, especially the, the veneration of the, the lowly stonemasons who were actually the skilled craftsmen who, who built their, their houses of worship. So um, the Four Crown Martyrs story or legend, at least the one we're going to talk about today, because there's mm-hmm. more than one, um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, takes place again at the last last quarter of the third century when Diocletian was emperor of the Roman Empire, um, and uh, you know his his reign really started a a series of of persecutions of the Christian Church, and uh, so it, the story um, tells the story of um, Diocletian going around and building uh, making stonemasons and craftsmen build. Uh, temples and, and statues of Roman gods. And there were um, four particular stonemasons uh, who were noted for their skill. They were distinguished for their skill, and their names were Claudius, Castorius, uh, Symphoranius, and Nicostratus. And uh, they were stonemasons who were very revered for their skill, but they were also secretly practicing Christians. And um, so they they met with um, one of a uh, one of their fellow workers who was a mason, but but was a heathen named uh, Simpli- Simplicius. And uh, Simplicius had a problem with his tools breaking. Uh, he just couldn't ever finish his work because he kept breaking his tools. So he noticed the craftsmen, um, the, the four craftsmen who were Christians and their work was beautiful. So he, he went to, um, Claudius and said, you know, 
please strengthen my tools so they don't break anymore. And Claudius prayed over them to the Christian God. And from that point on, uh, Simplicius, or Simplicius's tools didn't break. So Simplicius then enters into a dialogue with Claudius and says, well, you know, what God did you pray to for this? You know, was it Zeus? And Claudius says, no, it was it was our God, the God of Christianity. And as a result, uh, Simplicius then converts to Christianity. So there there are actually five martyrs in this story instead of a four, if you count uh, Simplicius, who um, converted to, to Christianity. Um, <clears throat> you know, looking looking at um, the the story, of course, uh, you know the the four slash five martyrs were um, sought out by Diocletian for their skill to um, to essentially build a a statue of, uh, I believe, Apollo, and um, they they essentially you know refused to do it. But, um, you know, it's, uh, they, they ended up getting killed because of, of their, um, their refusal. And there was, there was something to be said about them, you know, in, in one story, like they, they used a very low quality stone that wasn't mm -hmm. fit, fit for sculpting. Um, and then, uh, you know, they were found out because they had, you know, essentially, done a terrible job of the sculpture because the stone was unfit for sculpting and really really they interesting ended up, uh, mike, they were arguing what am i the, what am i missing were, from that mike go ahead there were four full okay what it amounts to is there's 622 craftsmen uh employed in the in this uh endeavor to build these temples and uh diocletian was looking for a stone to to have carved into the likeness of apollo and what happened was he found a stone. He said, this is going to be the one. And these four philosophers, not the, not the four craftsmen, four philosophers that worked for uh, Diocletian and the craftsmen began to argue about the quality of this stone and, it, and its work, you know, its ability to be used for this. And during all of this, they noted that these four craftsmen, these four stonemasons were not participating in the argument. And it be, then became focused on them, onto why are you not arguing for or against this? Why are you not even obeying your emperor in a decision to make this statue? And that's when they admitted to their Christianity. And that was the four, excluding Claudius at that time. Um, Claudius was not mentioned in this. Oh, and the one thing to mention too is uh, there was a, uh, I think it was an Archbishop Cyril or Pope, I can't remember, I think it was Archbishop, is the man who uh, baptized uh, Simplicus. And uh, he ends up in prison um, during all of this. But in any case, the four uh, craftsmen, like I said, admit to their Christianity in this, and that's why they refuse uh, to build uh, the statue of Apollo. Uh, because it goes against their uh, belief in the Christian God. And um, I'm trying to remember where that, how that was phrased. It's, uh, see, is that This is coming from Mackey's encyclopedia, right? Mackey's at the moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, God, who is our creator and the Lord of all things, had made his creatures. Now that's when they make Simplicus. Um, truly, we are Christians. Hereupon the philosophers chose other masons and caused them to make a statue uh, which had been rejected, which after 31 days they finished and presented to the philosophers. These then informed the emperor that the statue of Asclepius, which is really Apollo, was uh, finished when he ordered it to be brought before him for in, uh, inspection. But as soon as he saw it, he was greatly astonished and said, this is proof of skill of these men. Uh... That was having to do with those four. I don't see where uh, it's funny because you know it proves their skill, but they refuse to uh, to do it, and then they get they get whipped with uh, what's known as scorpions. Um, uh, basically, you know, 
tip, tipped with uh, multi-headed whips uh, to the point, you know, now they're not even whipped to death on that because actually after the, uh, the tribune, the tribune who uh, actually ordered them to be whipped, uh, Lampadius, he uh, then dies of a cramp. And when he yes, dies, that's, right. that's when Diocletian then orders them, orders the building of lead lined coffins and for them to be thrown into the Danube, uh, sealed into those coffins. And there's a whole thing even after all of this about their um, to prevent and, and it's different Masonic numbers vampires. of days, basically because they actually are, uh, after so many days, uh, they are revived from these coffins, not necessarily alive, but they are actually uh, brought out of the water and uh, their bodies transferred. Exhumed, that's the word I'm looking for, yeah. yeah but there's different this, different ends to that even. The whole thing is, is so wild to me uh, because there's this really big disparity between the Masonic version of this and the uh, historical version of this and yet even still another version that we find from catholic church references um they like they call it the first because this is actually there's a church in in rome that is the church of the quadar coronati and uh they actually have 13 martyrs there uh, they have the first group, which is what they call the first group, which is these four Roman soldiers who are not the uh, stonemasons. Mm -hmm. But then when they describe it, they say that these four uh, Roman soldiers who are like bookkeepers, essentially, uh, they refuse to sacrifice incense to Asclepius and are then uh, beaten and... Uh, then two years after the death, uh, this this all apparently happens two years after the death of the five sculptures, the sculptors. But what's confusing is that Severus, Victorinus, um, uh, what was the other guy, uh, Severian, and is it uh, Carporphorus? These four guys are these soldiers who they call the first group yet they apparently die after the second group which is the the five sculptors and then there is apparently a couple other people um, including uh, the head of saint sebastian which is kept in this church as well but those five sculptures the the, the catholic church um, says that they were drowned in the sava river so there's a lot of like really weird mixing of this and historically um, the religio mythology side and the Masonic side don't necessarily jive with the exception of this idea of four crowned martyrs, three potential groups and 13 people. Oh, it's right. really, really interesting. So, it's a and, and scholarship today um, has posited that the first group didn't actually exist. <gasps> and the story of the first group was a retelling of the original, you know, four crown martyrs, which was the second group uh, consisting of the, the five craftsmen. Gotcha. Mm. So before we I wanted to point sort out, through that, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Juan. I was going to point out about RJ making reference to the to the church that that was erected it was done in 16 625 by the aptly na named pope honorius and it was erected in the memory of the four saints and it says here out of the ruins of the temple of diana of diana on the colian hill and this was it says here that during the reign of well during the days of pope leo the fourth around 800 uh the year 848 the remains of many other martyrs were translated to rome including to this uh, particular church and it's interesting it says those uh it says here that the remains were translated it says the the remains of the five sculptors the four masons and other saints to 
they were put in an oratory beneath the altar of the church. But it's cool that as the years continue to go by, they add sarcophagus that have uh, relics from many other martyrs. So here you have individuals honored, right? And you have them, their remains on their entirety. But it's almost like this particular church starts getting this reputation for holding the remains of all these different martyrs. So you could imagine when people uh, do pilgrimage to it, they're they're honoring all the people that gave their lives so that they can practice their faith. Do, do we think well, that they actually do exist today, still in that that same church? Uh, well, or it, is it still in the mythos <laughs> kind of realm? Is the shroud the way of that it's, it's real? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A, there's also the fact that that church mm -hmm. the, or basilica was actually sorry, uh, destroyed dead. and then rebuilt also from the foundations up as well. Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying there's a chance. Well, you there's know, it's like always it's another another interesting factoid about this uh, this entire story is that even within the the second account or the second group, there are multiple different tales and multiple different versions there is a later version of the story that inserts the miracle of the tools into the story so talking about how simplicius goes to claudius and asks for claudius to strengthen his tools uh, and claudius blesses the tools so that they then you know miraculously never break again and that is that is not present in the original version and so it, it could be posited that the miracle was inserted into the story after a late, you know, in a later version um, to, you know, fulfill the requirements for sainthood. Never oh my God, a, Jason, you're making this a, sound like the New Testament. Stop never let it. a story get in the way of the truth. Yes. Or, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm way channeling my, I my caught inner a fish. Bart Ehrman. This Yeah, I, I, I caught that. How big? <laughs> well, well, you know, so when you I really think criticism. about it, though, if, if you actually read this, this legend, though, as you read the legend as it's written, the, the one that is accepted as the story of the four martyrs that are craftsmen, it has a very degree flavor to it. I'm not going to say that it is a degree because I don't see that, but it has a degree flavor to it. Uh, in, in, in an allegorical sense. I mean, it's there. I'm not going to say that there's an answer to the allegory as to what it, what you're learning from this other than sticking to your faith. I mean, that would be, you know, uh, one there, but uh, that's, that's what I got as I read it. I'm like, wow, this has a, it has a flavor. Like, I mean, I could almost see to, as funny as it sounds, I could almost see this being a, uh, a Scottish Rite degree. I would have said um, almost a Templar because of the Christian uh, angle to it, but I would say more one of the Scottish Rite degrees, you know. North it's already the Four a, Chaplains a, you know, degree, right? Is it the Four Chaplains degree? It could, yeah, you could put it there. No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, no, back really, to because the I've seen the Four Chaplains, so yeah. <laughs> so with the archaeology that, that, Juan was really talking about, like, are the bodies still there? And, and, you know, we're kind of going back and forth on that for a moment. It was interesting because one of the things that I researched for this particular episode, because again, I only knew about the four martyrs because there's a lodge uh, in my neighboring state called the four martyrs and it's an education lodge. And that's all I really knew about them. I knew they were kind of quasi connected to Freemasonry somehow. And so one of the videos that I watched about it was actually a video that was all about the church. And they do claim that there are 13 exhumed uh, bodies that are uh, there in the basilica. Uh, I could only, and, and when they referenced that the head of St. Um, Saint Sebastian is there, like a head of a saint is in this basilica i i mean that would be absolutely fascinating i'm not being morbid i'm just fascinated by the idea of keeping these these kind of like holy relics of what we would call like essentially the uh, christian hollows or um 
you know, anybody, I don't want to make a comparison of, of Harry Potter to, you know, Christianity like other people may have, but the idea of these holy artifacts that uh, are out there, it's, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yep. like Galileo's finger. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, you know, I, John, I think you were going to read something from the Regis poem. Yeah, which is cool because you're like so what so what's the Masonic connection? That's the real the real question right. there. Um, because if we have this the story that dates into the the you know the early two hundreds three hundreds um, built into early Christian Christian faith and mythology um, and part of you know the the Catholic uh, instruction, then then where's the link? Especially if Catholics and Freemasons never really uh, never really got along. Um, in the past so the connection to freemasonry is uh when you think about the 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 old charges right the um the regis poems and all the other manuscripts that have been around um way before 1717 or 1721 um you you have to look at where were these um guilds and unions started right where do we get these the, the rules of being an apprentice and the rules of, of how do you treat, you know, a fellow uh, stonemason, right? Remember all those old charges. We've done an earlier episode on that. Highly encourage you to go back and, and check that out. But the one in particular was probably one of the earliest ones was the Regis poem or Regis manuscript, um, which is dated circa 1390. And so uh, we have a direct reference to the, the four crown ones. In fact, I'm going to read an excerpt out of there. Um, again, this isn't this poem is not going to sound rhymy because it's you know the the old english has changed over the years so in a modern translation um one section of the regis poem talks about the art of the four crowned ones which goes pray we now to almighty god and to his mother mary bright that we may keep these articles and also these points as those four holy martyrs did who were greatly honored in this craft they were as good masons as there are, stone carvers and makers of statues, for they were among the best workmen. The emperor greatly admired them and ordered them to make an image that might be worshipped for him. He had such idols in his day to turn the people away from Christ's law. But they were steadfast in Christ's law as well to their craft. They loved God and all his teachings and were always in his service. They were true men at that time and followed God's law well. They would not make any idols, not at any price. To believe in an idol instead of their God, they would not do, even if he was furious, for they would not forsake their true faith and believe in his false law. The emperor soon arrested them and put them in a deep prison. The harder he punished them there, the more joy they had of Christ's grace. Then, when he saw no other way, he condemned them to death. By the book it shows, in the legends of the Holy Ones, the names of the Quator Coronatrum. Their feast day will be, without doubt, the eighth day after Halloween. So, that's just the excerpt out of there. Eighth day after Halloween, which had become, by this point in time, 1390 as it's written, the Catholic feast day of the, the Four Crowned Martyrs. So I think it's an interesting excerpt. And you can hear how the story has changed, has been embellished, has had a little Masonic tale, sounds a lot like a, a degree system, right? These people who are so, so firm a, a, into their fidelity and trust in, in their, their belief that they would become, they would die for, for something rather than give up something. Sound familiar? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Well, and th it also turns out that the four crown martyrs became the patron saints of the stonemasons guild system in germany so they were they were to the german stonemasons as saint john the baptist and saint john the evangelist are to speculative masons which is pretty cool yeah so there i mean not the whole dying thing but <laughs> yeah. or now what i find or... What I find very interesting, though, is that our landmarks uh, of Freemasonry point out that, uh, as, you know, which goes back to the uh, 
operative Masons to uh, abide by the religion of the area that you're in. And that we use these four saints, you know, in operative Masonry uh, as, you know, as the patron saints of uh, Mason, stone Masons, when in fact they were going against that landmark because they were refusing basically to go with the religion of their area and create that stone because it was against their Christian faith. Now, I mean, like I said, it does have a, a you know, a degree feel to it because of the fact that they're sticking to their guns. You know, they're in the face of um, in the face of certain death. They are planning to, you know, not build this uh, statue. Now that has a, you know, has a certain feel to it in that way. But even in that, it still comes down to they should have built it anyway, based on the ancient landmarks. I mean, do you guys feel that or, you know, what do you think? Which landmarks? <laughs> and so, and again, you know, how ancient are the ancient landmarks? We're talking about, you know, the late 200s, early 300s common era. Um, you know, ancient landmarks, you know, might have been employed, you know, around the you know, the Middle Ages, you know, 11th, 12th century, sometime around, you know, Regis poem or maybe, you know, a couple hundred you, years before. Are you mixing two things when you say that? Like, we see ancient charges and then there's landmarks. Oh, maybe that's what maybe. I was doing. Yeah. You know, maybe. like landmarks. Do you... Influenced by. That stuff yeah. is made up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, well yes. They, they are, they aren't, right? Because we did talk about the influence of these old charges into yeah, the you're right. the landmarks. Because, you know, just a spoiler alert, if you go back and listen to our, our landmarks episode, you know, Mackie basically wrote them down, you know, like, like crap, someone should really actually write these things down that we say we're upholding. And so this was a much later afterthought. But um, even those that were oral tradition had come had been influenced by these old charges so if you read the old charges you're going to see things that are very familiar in masonic lodges today about uh you know uh order operations you know who runs and rules and governs and how that all works from a guild system perspective so um but yes you're absolutely right because then it then it changes over time But there's no innovations in Mason. No, no, not <laughs> Sorry. at all. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> different topic, different night. Uh. <laughs> uh, so I guess then the, the last, you know, like segue into this is, um, Robert, you mentioned that there's a lodge uh, near you called the, the Four Crowned Martyrs or the Four Martyrs. Is that correct? What was the name of that lodge? Yeah, it's Lodge of the Four. It's the Four Crowned Martyrs Lodge. The Four Crowned Martyrs, yeah. right. Um, and then um, that also leads into one that you may have been uh, heard of or alluded to throughout this episode, which is uh, the Quatuor Coronati uh, Lodge, uh, which is a premier research lodge out of England. Um, have you guys you guys heard of this and, and talked to any of them? Yeah, I think anybody who's anybody is published in Quatuor Coronati. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> big I mean, dogs. Yeah. I mean, it is they, an elite research lodge, right? They, they are. But, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of folks might think like uh, there is this pedigree of writing experts and there's all this stuff. And, and of course, they are very strict, I think, in, in some of their uh, requirements for the papers that are written there. Um, and some dudes that I know get turned off by this because they feel like it's too uh, too brainy and there's not enough there's not enough weird in it uh, for, for them, like kind of some more esoteric veins of thought. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So uh, I would dispel that rumor. Uh, if you pick up Kotor Coronati, uh, some of the research lodge pe papers and, and the like, uh, a lot of fascinating research has gone on there. Um, and the United States equivalent, um, the oldest uh, research lodge in the States is, uh, I believe, the Philolathes. So uh, we have that in the UK as uh, uh, Kotor Coronati. But uh, there are 
you know, Kotoro Coronati Lodges, um, all, all over the, the U.S., like, I guess, chapters, you know, of, of research. Yeah, uh, in cool. fact, uh, one, of, one of our brothers who is in the chat this evening, uh, Brother Jose Venzer, um, he's the, uh, the QCCC local secretary for D.C., uh, so pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I will drop the, the link to, uh, Freemason for dummies blog spot, uh, Indiana grants dispensation to new lodge. And that is crowned martyrs, uh, which at the time at, that it was written was UD or under dispensation. Uh, but they are a full fledged, uh, chartered lodge now. And if you can visit, do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, based on memory, so it could be wrong, internet, please feel free to correct me, uh, that um, while it is based in uh, the UK, that they have actually had one American master of uh, the Quattro Coronati Lodge. You and, are correct. And, Jason, do you know who the answer is? His name is S. Brent Morris. He S. Brent is, Morris. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> and he's he's proud to share that every time you talk to him, so... Yes, <laughs> as I would too. Like, who wouldn't, right? Um, oh, oh, have you been a master of a, of a British lodge? No, I don't think so. So, yeah, it's, it's um, kind of like you, a How vegan? do you know if, if the person you're talking to is the only U.S. master of Quattro Coronati Lodge? The answer is, don't worry, he'll tell don't you. Worry. Don't, yeah, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I was waiting for you. He's also a vegan CrossFitter who owns a Tesla, so yes. That's a true story. <laughs> and a magician. And a magic, us. though. <laughs> and a magician, right. Because yeah, he's what? He's a member of the Invisible Lodge, isn't he? Didn't we talk about that once? Yes, he yes. is. Yes, he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as um, can't can't say enough how um, how much research has gone into uh, the Quattro Coronati Lodge. I mean, it, and it's not a recent thing because uh, they go very far back. They have tons of archives so for anyone who's really interested in any sort of masonic research really good academic like i can cite all my sources i can really pull together cogent logical arguments like you really need to go look through their archives sometimes they print them up um and, you know and that's one of the perks of membership very very rarely can you find some of that stuff online at least without you know asking and, and uh, that kind of thing so you should really uh, take the opportunity if you can get a hold of some of the research. Maybe go to your Grand Lodge. Might have a couple copies of some of their, um, you know, their pub the publications. It's it's certainly worth skimming through, if nothing else, just for curiosity's sake. Uh, go check out uh, some of their uh, proceedings and publications because uh, you won't be disappointed in the the caliber, the quality, and and just the uh, the attention to detail that, that goes into uh, that that type of research. Mm -hmm. So we have so we have the four crown martyrs. Did we ever did we ever figure out the discrepancy between the four and the five? Did did, did we did we figure out why there was a discrepancy? It, or is it it's, just it's mostly embellishment if you look at over the time? historical. It's it's just really differences in the the way the legend was retold, and then uh, because there's different names that actually come up in it as well. Uh, it ends up becoming because there's there's this that's where I was talking about the uh, uh, degree field to some of this. There's actually several where they lose the names of the uh, uh, of the martyrs, and then years later they're found, or another uh, one of the popes decides that it's these names, and he you know adds that to uh, one of the uh, uh, books of you know their. Uh, their claims to it all. But in the end, uh, so far, the, the ones that actually stick as the uh, top four, five are the ones as uh, uh, Claudius, Nicostratus, Symphorinius, Castorius, and Simplicus. Those are the ones that end up being the five. Now, you know, the very fact that Simplicus is added because of his conversion, uh, I think that, that helps to create some of the... Uh, uh, confusion of being four versus five because, but then I, that's where I said that usually in the story piece where that the refusal is happening, Claudius isn't there and being or being mentioned. So you get uh, 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 Castorius, Nicostratus, and uh, Symphoranus and Sim 
Simplicus uh, being involved. So, you know, I mean, it. there were five, but in the end, you know, only four of them ended up uh, there at the time. We don't, we don't ever find out why Claudius wasn't involved. But then, you know, the, like, the, like the later stories we talk about where uh, there were the five that were uh, the craftsmen who were, refused to do the work, and then they were um, executed in, uh, by being beaten and then thrown into the river. And then there's the, uh, later on, there's actually a tale of the four officers who also, there's also another tale where they're mentioned to have refused to uh, take part in the uh, execution of these uh, five. Uh, so these four actually get beheaded for that. And it's, again, it's another, because they're Christian, you know, they're refusing to do that to other Christians. Um, and that's the Roman officers. Uh, but in the, I mean, but again, when you go back and find all the, the, the ones that end up being considered authoritative sources end up being uh, that it's the four uh, craftsmen that, uh, that I've mentioned already. So. Yeah, and what I found interesting was uh, in the video that I had watched regarding this, um, it, it just told a little bit about the, the history of it in terms of uh, the video is clearly a, a tour of the Christian churches of Europe, and it's done by a religious organization. So, uh, but it was interesting to, because they went into an area where I didn't think they would go, which was they talked about how they got the names of those originals, which uh, as Jason and Mike had now given some color to uh, may not have actually existed at all and was just the five. Um, and those four originals that they claimed, the names were, you guessed it, divinely inspired. Uh -huh. so. Which actually that leads to the, the final question of the night is as a, a myth that is may or may not be based on some actual historical things. Uh, how do you feel its relevance to the founding of Freemasonry, Freemasonry today? Uh, this this four crown martyrs myth fits into our experience, and so let's start going around. I'll talk to uh, Robert for the final question. I think it's. I think it fits and has a, one of my great mentors in this fraternity was a devout Christian and really, really loved Commandery. Now, at the time that I had joined Commandery, uh, I, I was not like your typical type of uh, Christian. There were there are uh, stipulations about, you know, in some states that only Christians can join. I mean, we know uh, Brother Scott Sherman, who is Jewish, is also, you know, he's in the temple, the, the commandery as well. So they, they make these, uh, I don't know, stipulations or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I remember what, what Brad told me after I came out of the first portion of the degree. He said, it's re I, he said, how did you like that? And I said, it was really amazing. And he said, yeah, and it's, it's just so much more special for the Christian Mason. And I feel that same way about this Legend of the Crown Martyrs. The, regardless of the truth of who was first, second, or third group, all of that stuff kind of, in my mind, doesn't matter because it's the spirit of the idea um, that matters most. And even if you're not a Christian, I think what this offers for Freemasonry is the idea, as Mike pointed out, uh, it could be a degree unto itself because it teaches a lesson. There's the ideas, you know, all the Masonic virtues are there. Temperance, prudence, fortitude, justice, they're all in that story. And I think you could pull that thread and pull a lot of meaning out of it um, that is essentially Masonic. And the fact that these likely were stonemasons, 
uh, that adds to the uh, distant connection, right, of the guild system of which we, you know, perhaps came from. Uh, so I think that overall, I think it's meaningful to masonry. And I think it adds something particularly special of note for the Christian Mason. But even for the non-Christian Mason, I think it's valuable because of the virtue that the story tells us. Uh, no, no different than when we tell a story today to our kids of uh, Hercules and his trials, or um, you want to talk about Odysseus and his travels, um, you know, whatever the case is, all of these stories have an allegorical meaning that span time and speak to the person who's getting told this story. And uh, it's just really important. So that, that's how I feel about it. If you like Masonic podcasts like this, tune in to Whence Came You, 930 Sunday nights. Uh, this upcoming week, we are diving into part two, Max Hindle's Ancient and Modern Initiation. And we've also got a new Masonic Minute with illustrious Brother Harrison and some news about Wilmshurst U. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, uh, Juan Sepulveda. Is the history myth important in masonry today? Yeah, I I love your question. It reminds me of a quote that's attributed to Marcus Aurelius, and it, it says, waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. And that's how I try to take all these different stories. Does it matter if Hiram Abiff really existed? Does it really matter if he actually did go through the turmoils that we describe in the in the degrees does it does it matter if tony starks really uh really existed it's the archetype that that we model is what we can learn from their experiences from their virtues from their from their vices from their flaws their shortcomings all of those aspects are what we can distill when we approach these stories with an open mind and an open heart. So my encouragement to the brothers listening and watching, if you read the story, doesn't think about this. Does it really matter if there were four martyrs, if there were five, if the, the inclusion of that fifth is just a later uh, aggregation? It doesn't really matter. What is the story that's described? You have these men who were recognized by their craftsmanship. And when their craftsmanship was, in a sense, held hostage by a demand for them to compromise their values, they knew what their values were, and they knew how much they were worth. So they weren't willing to compromise. So they stood their ground, and they actually denied not just an opportunity, they denied their own existence by standing their ground and and, and starting f standing firm in what they believe. So if you that listen have something that you believe intently, if you have a faith, if you have a discipline, if you have a doctrine, if you have a, a practice that you are convinced is, is something that you're willing to fight for, do so. Don't compromise it whenever it, it becomes challenged by people in a higher power. So thank you as always for, for listening to the Masonic Roundtable, for watching, for sharing. Thank you to all our patrons for their generous support, always being there for us. Hopefully you get something beneficial out of the programs we put together for you. And if you like the kind of content that helps a man uh, become better, a good man become better, I encourage you to go check out The Gentleman's Brotherhood, where we have some really cool stuff happening in the next few months, including a course to help you set bigger goals and actually achieve them. John Ruark and I will take you by the hand and get you uh, to that next level. I'd crush it. Thank you, brothers. All right. It's going to be stuff. awesome. Okay. Uh, Hammy. So um... – does it uh, actually, you know, help with if we, you know, apply to Freemasonry? Yes, you know, I think it does. I think that, uh, you know, as Juan pointed out, um, that, you know, if it has a good enough lesson in there, it's going to uh, apply. 
And I believe that. And the fact that they were one, were later adopted by the stonemasons in Germany uh, to be their uh, patron saints, I believe that that helps uh, with the application of all that. However, the one thing I wanna I wanted to reach out and touch on, which we really didn't a little bit here, is the connection to the Catholic Church because. Um, one thing to understand here is the Catholic Church did, you know, um, acknowledge these as martyrs, and you know they have the there's the the several uh, different uh, basilicas and churches throughout Europe that are, you know, either the four martyr or the Cator Coronati and so forth. Now, the one thing to understand here though is that the Catholic Church is not connected with Freemasonry. All they were was the employers of operative Masons. Um, in in that in that they are not accepting Freemasonry in having martyred these craftsmen. Um, that's something that Gould felt very important to point out and disabuse anyone of that notion that uh, the Catholic Church was in any way, uh, you, you know, in a sense, connected to the beginnings and origins of Freemasonry in that and in that in the, how we have it today, because they are definitely not a fan of uh, speculative Freemasonry. So anyway, that's, I just wanted to touch on that. So. Thank you. Again, again, I think that this I think this is a great thing. This the Kator Coronati, uh, the legend. I think it makes a great Masonic connection. All right. Thank you, Hammy. Jason. So <clears throat> when you look at if you if you ascribe to the transitional theory of origins of speculative masonry, wherein the operative stonemasons guilds over the course of a uh, hundred plus years slowly evolved into um well really several hundred years slowly evolved into the speculative fraternity that we know today then i do think the story has a great deal of continued significance because it was clearly of significance to the operative stonemasons who became the foundation for the speculative masonic fraternity allegorically the tale of the four crowned martyrs tells a story of fidelity not unlike stories told in contemporary speculative masonry so i think it's a very interesting story i think it's one that uh you know would not surprise me at all to have been turned into some sort of side degree um that that was lost to time uh, and I, you know, I, I do think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's of interest enough to, you know, have the premier research lodge in the world, uh, you know, named, named after it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, you know, it's a very interesting story. Uh, you know, how much of it, you know, actually happens, I, you know, that's not, that's not something we'll, we'll ever know but that doesn't diminish the power of the allegory and the continued impact of the allegory on, you know, the modern organization. It tells, it tells a tale of fidelity, um, sticking to your moral code, uh, in face of certain death. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's very much a, a key tenet of, of masonry. Yeah. The best part about going last is, I get to say what Jason said because yeah, the, it's it's all about the allegory, right? Um, you know, it, it probably frustrates literal historians that try to dive into Masonic research, uh, but that's not the point. Uh, at least, at least that's not part of the point. Is to really learn something to get uh, the so what behind the words, behind the story, so that uh, you can take some of those lessons, apply them to your personal life, and become a better man by just doing it. So, yeah, I think um, I, I I'm fascinated with the the history and fascinated with the religious insertion into the Masonic um, mythos. Uh, I'm really fascinated with uh, the lessons that are taught there and how, how to, you know, apply those um, as, as they're described in that, that uh, test of fidelity. So um, yeah, really good episode, learned a lot. And um, I think it's just a, a really, a really interesting facet and in how we all brought this, brought this back together. So um, 
that's re really all I've got. Uh, I really want to thank you guys very much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Keep searching for more light. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.